So my favorite pastor teacher, Dr. John Danish, comments on Exodus 21 to 22. But it, and if men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child, word which applies to unborn or born child, so that she literally, her children come out as a mis and has a miscarriage, here's that word, yet there is no further injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. But if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty for li life for life. Dr. Dana says, verse 22, these men struggle with each other. One of them strikes a woman with child so that she has a yatsa. She has a premature delivery. Yet there is no physical injury, and that refers to both of them, to the woman or the child and or. She's all right, and the baby is viable and able to live outside the womb. Now, we have this further reinforced by the fact that there are Hebrew words which mean being born dead, stillbirth, so that there is an exact word, this is rendering in English, so that there is an exact word that could have been used if this woman had a miscarriage and had a dead baby. That's what the phrase in this verse, no further injury, covers. The child was born prematurely. He was not born dead. One of those Hebrew words looks like this in English letters. Shekol, which is used in several places. Genesis 31, 38. These 20 years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten the rams of your flocks. Miscarried, Shekol, born dead. Translation is the same miscarriage, but you have to go to the original text here. Exodus 30, 23, 26. There shall be no one miscarrying or barren in your land, I will fulfill the number of your days, miscarrying a shekel, giving birth to dead babies. Job 21.10 His ox mates without fail, his cow calves, uh, calves and does not abort. Abort means shekel, born dead. At the watch your translations here. Hosea 9.14 Give them, O Lord, what will thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Here, in this case, the rendering in English is miscarrying womb, is shekel again, dead birth, a condition where the child, children are born dead, and therefore the mothers have dry breasts because there is no one to feed. Yet, there is yet another word which the Holy Spirit could have used, nephal, which carries the same idea of being born dead, Job 3.16, or like a miscarriage which is discarded, or would not be as infants that never saw light. Psalm 58.8, same word. Let them be as a snail which melts away as it goes along, like the miscarriages of a woman which never sees the sun. Dr. Danish continues, So what happened to this woman in the fight before, or here, in Exodus 21, verse 22, is that she had a premature delivery. It was not that the child was killed in the process. And then it says, No other injury the guilty man is going to have to pay an appropriate fine to the husband as determined by him, and the judges. The reason for this <clears throat> is that the woman has suffered mental and emotional stress, and therefore she is to be recompensed for that by the fine, All, also any punitive damages. So, now supposing the worst thing happened. The baby is killed as a result of this man's deliberately striking of the woman. But if there is injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty life for life. So the loss of life by either the woman and or the baby is clearly to result in the loss of life of the man who deliberately struck the woman and caused either woman and or the baby's death. So, so abortion was a capital crime in Israel. And the language here in the Hebrew makes this very clear. Note that if the death of anyone is unintentional, then the punishment is not death, but the individual responsible must flee to a city of refuge, Deuteronomy 19.4-13, back in the old days. The context of the passage in Exodus 21, 22-23 describes a deliberate striking of the woman by one of the men. Notice that verses 24-25 to go on to indicate like injury for the injury, injury of the man caused, indicating that the punishment must fit the crime. So here in the Old Testament, under the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, the unborn child is determined by God's word as murder, punishable by death. There is no permission given in the birth of the Bible 
whatsoever for abortion. We have Charles, Dr. Charles E. Rice states, in an article in the New American Magazine, in an article entitled, Are There Any Hard Cases? Killing to save a life does not justify abortion. Both lives count. That's his point. The most difficult case is that in which an abortion is supposedly necessary to save the life of the mother. First, we should remember that an, abor an operation to remove the cancerous womb of a pregnant woman or to relieve an extra uterine pregnancy can be performed even under Catholic teaching, where such surgery is necessary to save the life of the mother, even though it causes the death of the unborn child. Morally, such an operation is justified by the principle of the double effect. Since the death of the child is an unintended effect, of an independently justified operation. The surgery does not involve the intentional killing of the child for the purpose of achieving another good. Legally, such an operation is not regarded as abortion at all. There is no need, therefore, to provide an exception for such cases in a law prohibiting abortion, save the life of the mother. Apart from cases such as the extrauterine pregnancy <clears throat> and the cancerous uterus, there appears to be no medical justification for terminating a pregnancy. Dr. Bernard Nathanson, who himself was responsible for 30,000 abortions, wrote in his book, after he stopped doing abortions, <clears throat> that we propose a lengthy list of illnesses, including but not limited to heart or kidney disease, which would justify abortion. With, we regard that list now with a growing sense of disbelief. If women with heart and liver transplants plants, can be carried successfully through pregnancy, we can no longer conceive of any medical condition which would legitimize abortion. In short, we have slowly evolved to an unshakable posture of no exceptions. So even if there were a case in which an abortion is necessary to save the life of the mother, Abortion should not be allowed. This is what he's saying now. After 30,000 abortions, if two people are on a one-man raft in the middle of the ocean, the law does not permit one to throw the other overboard to save his own life. Otherwise, might, might would make right. In maternity cases, the duty of the doctor is to use his best efforts to save both his patients, the mother and her child. He should not be given a license to kill intentionally either of them. Both lives count. In opposition to abortion, in cases where it is supposedly necessary to save the life of the mother, is dismissed by some as a cruel sectarian dictate of the Catholic Church, which is charged with preferring the life of the unborn child to the life of the mother. The reality is different. Never, and in no case, said Pope Pius XII in 1951, has the Church taught that the life of the child must be preferred to that of the mother. It is erroneous to put the question with this alternative, either the life of the child or that of the mother. No, neither the life of the mother nor that of the child can be subjected to direct suppression. In, in the one case, as in the other, there can be but one obligation to make every effort to save the lives of both of the mother and of the child. The moral prohibition against abortion in whatever case, is an application of the absolute principle that there is none, no, that that no, let's see, application of the absolute principle that no none ever has the right, no one, oh, okay, no one ever has the right intentionally to kill the innocent. An incidental consideration is that any language in a law allowing an exception for abortion to save the life of the mother will be open to a an expansive interpretation allowing abortion, for example, whenever the physician claims he perceives a risk that the mother may commit suicide if she is not allowed to have her child killed. What? Weird. If, if an example should not be made where the life of the mother is concerned, then it should not be made for any lesser reason. To allow abortion to prevent injury to the mother's mental or physical health where her life is not in danger, is to allow killing for what ultimately amounts to convenience. And to kill the unborn child because he may be defective is to do what the Nazis did 
to the Jews whose lives they regarded as not worth living. Point 10. Punish the rapist, not the unborn child. Politically, the most appealing cases in which to allow abortion are those involving rape and incest. A victim of rape or incest has the right to resist her attacker, but the unborn child is an innocent non-aggressor and should not be killed because of the crime of his father. Since the woman has the right to resist the rapist, she also has the, the right to resist his sperm. Non-abortive measures can be taken, consistent with the law and even Catholic teaching, promptly after the measures after the rape, which are not intended to abort and which may prevent conception. However, once the innocent party is conceived, he should not be killed. Consider the time it takes for the baby to be born, nine months or thereabout, and uh, the decision could have been made all along uh, to prevent the uh, pregnancy. When questioned in Arizona about whether he would favor an exception to allow abortion for a woman who had been raped, Presidential candidate Pat Buchanan revoiced re his firm conviction that abortion should be totally prohibited. It totally prohibited. I don't care about the circumstances of the child's conception. If you want to execute somebody in the case of rape, execute the rapist and let the unborn child live. Buchanan said later that he did not endorse the death penalty for rapists, but he held firmly to his own non no exception position. <laughs> on legal protection for the unborn. So, supporters of the abortion attack, the no exception position, is heartless and insensitive to the needs of the mother, and many abortion opponents concede that abortion ought to be allowed in hard cases to see if it really makes sense to forbid abortion in every situation. Well, that's a, that's a hard call. Compromise, point 11, i.e., the incremental approach leads to license to kill. Since 1981, the major elements of the pro-life movement have promoted incremental legislation that would allow abortion when the life of the mother is in danger, in pregnancies caused by rape or incest, and for minors who obtain parental consent. Such incremental legislative strategy, however, affirms the basic holding of Roe v. Wade that the unborn child is not a person and therefore has no constitutionally guaranteed rights. It is fair to suggest that these com these compromises this that these compromises or this compromise I'm trying to correct this guy's grammar. This compromise approaches, these compromised approaches have served to increase the toll of lives from abortion. For example, the enactment of a law requiring an unmarried minor to obtain parental consent before an abortion will predictably decrease the number of abortions from those under the previously unrestricted law. The proper comparison, however, would be between a situation in which the law was either wholly permissive or required parental consent on the other on the one hand and on the other a situation in which the pro-life movement and the churches were insisting that the murder of the innocent can never be rightly allowed the dominant abortions of the near future will be committed by pills implants and other devices. The only effective way the law can reach such early abortions will be by licensing and prescription restrictions and similar regulations. And that's going to be hard to do. But the only way to mobilize sufficient support for such restrictions will be to restore the public conviction that all life is sacred and must be protected by the law. When you have that point of view, all life mother and child, then you can maybe make some good choices on a case-for-case -case basis. That's kind of what it seems to be pointing toward. 
The incremental strategy 